Welcome to episode five of Back to the Futures, the official podcast of the Futures Collegiate Baseball League. My name is Matt Satilli. I am joined alongside by Owen Shadrick. Owen, good to see you, my friend. What's going on? Good to see you too, Matt. Things are starting to open up around Massachusetts, and I'm excited to kind of get back into the groove here a little bit. Yeah, and since we last recorded, we got some awesome news. The NBA is coming back. PGA Tour is returning this week. So, you know, the NHL announced their new playoff format. They're getting right to it. So stuff's starting to open up, and we're getting excited. We're getting a little antsy for some summer baseball here. Yes, we are. And we will share any updates we have as soon as we hear word. Uh, you'll be the first to know here on Back to the Futures. Uh, but for today, we have an awesome interview with Dylan Jones of the Nashua Silver Knights. It is our fifth representative from the fifth unique team. So we've had guys on from North Shore, Worcester, Brockton, Westfield, and now Nashua. So we're slowly making our rounds across the league. And we wanted to share that interview with you now. So without further ado, let's get into our interview with Dylan Jones. At this time, we now welcome on a very special guest. He was second team all FCBL in 2019, as well as a 2019 FCBL All-Star. It is Dylan Jones from the Nashua Silver Knights. Dylan, welcome on, and thank you so much for taking some time and joining us here today. Thank you, guys. Thank you for having me. Yeah, our pleasure. Uh, so we've been kind of starting off every interview by asking people what their setup is for quarantine. It's been a couple months now. So how have you been, and uh, have you been able to stay in baseball shape? How's your training regimen looking like? I've been good. I mean, uh, a bunch of guys from schools kind of stayed back because we all lived off campus, and the, uh, the school gave us access to the field that we could use, but they, we weren't allowed to use the gym. So a bunch of us went and got jobs working construction, and on the weekends we would kind of stay back and hit at the field, throw, do whatever we needed to do. That's awesome. So you're still up at school at Franklin Pierce right now? Yeah, yeah, I'm still up here. There's uh, only two of us left, me and my roommate, but we're still uh, st we're staying up here until summer ball. We're both still working, but trying to stay in shape using the field, like I said, every day that we can. Do you have any new skills or hobbies that you developed during quarantine? We talked to Angela Baez a couple of weeks ago, and he's now training to be a magician. Yeah, I did see that. Uh, I have not picked up any new skills or hobbies or anything. I've kind of just been working. So when we were trying to coordinate this interview, um, I was informed that you're starting work at 4 a.m. So can you just talk a little bit about what you're doing for work and how you've been adjusting to that early morning lifestyle now? Yeah, I have to wake up at about uh, 4.30 in the morning to go to work at, uh, I'm still, I'm in Ringe still, but the job site I'm working at is in Lowell. And it's like a big commercial construction site. And we're just putting up buildings. Uh, do you feel like that's helping your training regimen at all? Are you getting any uh, any back workouts or, you know, keeping oh, yeah, your body definitely. sharp? Definitely, definitely. It's uh, hard work, uh, to say the least. Just can't yeah. use it. Might as well do something like that. I can imagine. But, hey, always good to make some spare change and keep busy a little bit, get out of the house. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, how did you find out that your season was ending prematurely? If you can kind of walk us through when you got the news. And, you know, everyone we've talked to, we've, you know, tried to hear their perspective, and everyone seems to talk about starting to hit their stride and going into conference play. How did you feel like you were at in terms of your play this season, and, you know, what was your reaction when you first heard? Uh, I felt that, that I was off to a hot start. Me, myself, as well as my teammates, we were kind of on the, on the climb. The momentum was building, going into conference play, like you said. And then we were on the bus coming back from Cary, North Carolina, and we started hearing that some conferences were canceling the season and that some conferences were not canceling and continuing on with play. And then we heard that the College World Series was going to be canceled. And then about a couple days later, they came out and said that the NE10 canceled the season and that we were done. And I thought, like, the word, the word on the street was that no, that nobody was getting their year back at first. And then, like, I was a senior, and I, every, like myself and the rest of my seniors that I'm with were kind of freaking out. In the last game you played against St. Thomas Aquinas, you went two for four, you had three RBIs and three runs. How did you feel coming out of that game, especially after you found out that your season was ending? Uh, yeah, I uh, felt like, personally, I was starting to hit the ball well. Um, Off-speed pitches that, I, that they know that I can't really hit, I was sitting on, and that was what really carried the momentum out of that to the finish of that game and uh, as a team I felt like like you said we were just really picking up and starting to come into conference play hot 
Uh, did you have a chance to play against Angelo Baez? We talked to him on episode two, and he's a pitcher for St. Thomas Aquinas. Was he pitching that game? Uh, yeah, he pitched, I think, I believe the opening game in Cary, and uh, he really made me embarrass myself. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm curious about the camaraderie between guys who you play against in the FCBL uh, who also play college ball against you. Just kind of curious what your relationship is with some of those other players and, you know, how cool the opportunity is that you're playing against some of these guys at school and then you're going to be facing some of them again this summer. Yeah, I, I, I think it's really cool that, that you get to play with a bunch of guys that are from all over the country, a bunch of different colleges, but especially in the Northeast because the Futures League is obviously in the Northeast and you play a lot of kids that, that go to school in the Northeast and a lot of them are from the NE10 or from the conferences that are around the, the Northeast. And you gain a, a lot of really good friends, especially if they're on your team, but you definitely, if we're playing them in college ball, you definitely get a lot of, a lot of smack talk, but it's like friendly smack talk. And I think it's cool that you get to know a lot of guys that, that you get to play with in both leagues. On the flip side of that, you are teammates with Sean Babineau who transferred over from Springfield college to Franklin Pierce. And this summer, he'll be playing for the Worcester Bravehearts. What's that like playing against your teammates in the Futures League? I think it's, it's, uh, I, it's really fun to do, but it can also be really hard to do because they know exactly your weaknesses and you know theirs. So you don't really – it's like kind of like a guessing game on what you're going to get. Uh, so kind of transitioning into the FCBL, is there a natural connection between playing at Franklin Pierce in New Hampshire and then also getting a chance to play for Nashua? Like, how did you first make that connection with the front office and Cam Cook there? And, uh, you know, how did that conversation go when you decided to return this summer? I, uh, so my so right after my sophomore year was my first year with Nashua. And I really made a good relationship with BJ and K Jax, the, the, the two coaches over there. And I got invited back to come back next summer. And when our season got canceled, I think that was the first thing that came to my mind is I want to go back and play, play for Nashua again. Right. And that's something that's interesting, too, because, you know, typically if you finish up your senior year of eligibility, that would discount you from playing summer ball. But now you guys are getting an awesome opportunity to, you know, lace up your cleats again this summer. And then, you know, like you said, get a chance to come back to Franklin Pierce and play next year. So, you know. Was that something that you mentioned it immediately sparked your attention? But what does that mean to have a summer now to after you've been inactive for a couple months just to kind of get back in the flow of things? I, I think it's going to help me immensely because it's hard to just not play and then go back and play another season without having any at-bats or throwing or doing anything really game speed and then coming back and try to play a season. It's going to be pretty hard. So I'm very grateful for the opportunity to come back and play for Nashua. And uh, we touched on Babineau for a second, but you're also going to be bringing in some new teammates that you're playing with in Nashville from Franklin Pierce, Jackson Walker and John Mead. Uh, did you talk to them about your experience and, you know, recruit them at all? Or, you know, how excited are you to kind of show them the ways and show them how the Futures League operates? Yeah, Jackson is a, uh, he's a he was a freshman this year and he's uh, really good. And as soon as he found out that he was coming to Nashville, he came right to me and started asking me questions about, you know, how Nash was like, and he was really excited about, like, actually playing in front of a big amount of fans and traveling around. And then John Mead was actually my roommate last year. So he was, of course, asking me everything. And I think they'll, they'll, they'll both really enjoy it. They're both really good players, and hopefully we can keep that all rolling. Before we get back to our interview with Dylan Jones, we wanted to share a message from one of our sponsors, Change Up. We're excited to announce a brand new partnership this season with ChangeUp, a cutting edge player-centric pitch tracking solution promoting health and safety, allowing coaches to capture and analyze a proprietary set of performance analytics and helping pitchers maximize their potentials. Coming to baseball programs around the world this year, ChangeUp eliminates the administrative overhead associated with adhering to pitch count regulations, allowing coaches to focus on baseball. Coaches and parents at all levels, Little League, AAU, high school, and the collegiate level take notice. Changeup is the clear choice to ensure your pitchers aren't being thrown too much or too often and are getting proper rest. Together, we can make this great game even better by protecting arms and ensuring compliance with pitching guidelines. For more information, visit Changeup's website, www.changeup.io. That's www.change-up.io. Changeup, every pitch counts. Let's get back to our interview with Dylan Jones. Dylan, last season you were named to the 2019 second team All-FCBL and you were a 2019 All-Star. After a great season, you had 49 hits, you had 13 doubles, two home runs, 38 RBIs. What was it like to be named 
both an all-star and a second team all FCBL. And how did you feel like you played last season? I mean, it's an honor to be named to both of those. Uh, I felt like I was playing really well. It came off the momentum from my college season. You know, I didn't do too well my first summer in Nashua, so I felt like personally I had to redeem myself. Uh, I came in hurt and didn't know I was hurt, but I ended up having two broken bones in my hand, and trying to hit with that is borderline impossible. But I felt really good playing. I didn't know how well I was playing until, you know, towards the end of the season and, and things were picking up and still picking up. And then that last game against North Shore, uh, I felt like after the game was over that I personally had a very good summer and I was happy to bring that into my senior season. You mentioned the two broken bones in your hand. How did that happen? Oh, uh, yeah. The first week of my sophomore season uh, was the fifth game of the year. And I got I was, I had got the bunt sign. I was trying to drop a bunt down the third baseline and the kid kind of threw up my face and it was either my face or my hand. So I threw my hand up there to kind of try to block the ball and went to the ER right after the game. And they were like, nah, your wrist isn't broken. You're good. So I kept playing about five games later, my hand was about the size of my head and I went back to a hand specialist and he was like, yeah, you got two broken bones in your hand and one in your wrist. Was that the biggest injury you faced playing baseball? Uh, I believe so, yeah. Okay, well, you know, good thing it wasn't the face because that could have been a lot worse. But still, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you weren't thrilled about that uh, misdiagnosis at first. No, no, not at all. Really messed me up. Yeah, well, you know, your 2019 season, you came back and really showed out for yourself. So props to you. And looking ahead to 2020, uh, you guys are coming back with a large group of returning players. What does it mean to return with this cast of guys? And what are you guys looking to do to take the next step and, you know, just rally around each other? I think it's good when you come back and play with guys that you know, because you already, if you've played together before, I think I'm, I think there's a couple of kids that were also there in 2018. So that's going to be my third year playing with them. And I think it's good when you bring them all back because you already have that camaraderie together. And it's not like that awkward first day where you're still trying to get to know everybody. And then you go into the first game and that whole thing's trying to still going on. But I think it's good. And I think we're going to come together nicely and uh, hopefully we can take it all the way to the playoffs. Dylan, in the playing game versus North Shore that you touched on earlier, you guys had the lead and you unfortunately surrendered it. Did this loss add fuel to the fire for you to come back to Nashua and help influence your decision? It definitely does because when you lose a game like that, that you're up late in the game and then all of a sudden you end up losing the game. Uh, it definitely adds fuel to the fire. I mean, to come back and then say we play them again, you, you have that much more momentum towards the game that you want to bring into it because they ended your season last year. That means you want to end it again this year. And to any Nashville fans who might be listening, we're excited for your third season with the Silver Knights and excited to see the team back in action. What kind of message would you send to them? Yeah, I would just tell them that I'm looking forward to coming back out and seeing them all out there again, especially the, the loyal fans that are out there every single day. Uh, definitely looking forward to seeing Mad Dog and the traveling fans that come with us. So hopefully that they, they're allowed to come out and support yeah, we're looking forward to it, man. And, you know, fingers crossed that uh, stuff will reach a breakthrough point sooner than later. So uh, this has been an awesome interview so far, but uh, we want to dig a little bit deeper. So we got our final segment coming up. It is called Quick Hits. It is presented by Zephyr. It's the official on-field hat of the Futures League. Zephyr, high quality and innovative designs since 1993. So, Dylan, we wanted to ask a uh, couple more questions, so we'll keep the questions rolling here. Yep. Who's been your favorite teammate to play with in the Futures League? My favorite teammate to play with in the Futures League? Uh, I'd say Nick Bittison. Okay, what's your relationship like with him? I played with him for one summer. A kid goes to Virginia Tech, and there was just like that first year that I was in Nashville, there was just a group of guys that would always come back to my host family's house and we'd hang out all the time because I do have the best host family in the Futures League. And uh, he was just always with me. We were always together, and it would definitely made the summer that much better. Yeah, what's your experience like with a host family? I mean, you know, not being from New England and then coming up and, you know, transitioning to life from college to living with a host family. You want to shout them out and, you know, how awesome is that to have a family that just supports you and, you know, shows you some love away from home? Yeah, definitely big shout out to, to the Willett family. They, uh, so I was nervous, of course, moving into somebody's home that I didn't know. And uh, they definitely made the transition 100 times easier. I love them like family, and I'm looking forward to living with them again this year. That's awesome stuff, man. Uh, what's your favorite opposing ballpark to play at in the league? Definitely Worcester. Worcester is a great place to play. They always pack it out, and it's a, definitely a tough environment to play in if you're the opposing team. 
Yeah. And uh, do you excel when you have a lot of spectators and a lot of fans in the seat and you feel like that pressure is amplified a little bit or does that kind of help you collect yourself? I think it, I think it's uh, definitely like a burden, but also at the same time, it, it helps you out. It's uh, you know that there's people watching, but you're this, you're just there to play baseball and they're there to watch you. I love it. Uh, and what's your walk up song, whether it be at school in the futures league, what'd you use last year? And is there anything you got that you're thinking about using this summer? I had a bunch of walk up songs last year. I usually try to stick with reggae because it keeps me like kind of calm. Like you walk up to the beat and that, but I think my one last year in Nashville was go loco and I might have to stick with that this year. Okay. I like it coming off a good season, you know, don't want to mess yeah. with success. Don't want to change anything. Love it. Uh, I see you got a Florida Marlins poster in the background. Is that your favorite pro team? It is. It is. I grew up watching the Marlins. I live 30 minutes from Miami. So uh, I also grew up working for their spring training facility, Roger Dean Stadium, Marlins and Cardinals. I was on the grounds crew there. So I grew up watching the Marlins. That's awesome, man. What is, what is that experience like working grounds crew for a major league team? Uh, it's awesome. If I would advise anybody that has a chance to do it, to do it, because I remember just being 15, 16 years old, going to spring training games on the field, working on the field and looking up and seeing D Gordon right next to me or Giancarlo Stanton or anybody on the Marlins like Yadi Molina on the Cardinals. It was pretty awesome. What was a neat experience? If you can, you know, walk us through any kind of player experiences, if you had like some banter back and forth with them or just, you know, especially a facility that houses two teams. Like, that's awesome. I had a chance to visit the one in West Palm where the Nationals and Astros yep. play at. Um, but, you know, what was something that really stood out that you'll always remember? Uh, something that I'll always remember was, I believe it was spring training, my very last year there. So 2016, um, spring training, I was still in high school. And I had, like, my day ones and day twos. I didn't have class on day twos in high school, so I'd work. And it's spring training game, that was a Marlins and Cardinals game. And D Gordon, right before, he, literally right before he had to go onto the field, walked in with a catered Chick-fil-A for all the guys at the grounds crew. And he just walked in and was like, here you go, guys. Thank you for all your help. And I think that's one thing that, that really stuck with me. How do you end up scoring a job at a spring training facility like that? I'm not too sure. I've always loved, like, working outside and working on baseball fields or building things. Like, hence why I'm working construction right now. Um, but... I think I was, I had just graduated, or not graduated, but I just ended my last year of middle school and I just decided to send the guy an email and was like, hey, do you have any open spots? And he was like, yeah, come on down. And we have a really good personal relationship now with my boss. Like my, my dad hangs out with him all the time. Uh, he pretty much watched me grow up, taught me a lot of the stuff that I know today. So have you had a chance to visit Marlins Park? And what is that experience like compared to the old stadium they shared with the Dolphins? Yeah, I've been to Marlins Park a handful of times, but it's definitely a massive park, one of the biggest ballparks I've ever, I've ever been to. Like, I've been to Fenway. I've been to the old Brave Stadium, to, uh, Trop. I've been to almost every one on the East Coast. And I definitely say Marlins Park is definitely the biggest, but they don't have loyal fans, so definitely not my favorite one to go to. What's your opinion on the statue, the center field? I think statue. it needed to go as well. <laughs> Okay. And uh, I mean, that place is full of amenities. You got the glass fish tank behind yeah. home plate. Were you there for any of the all-star festivities a couple years ago? I was not. There was a group of guys that I was working with that got to go down and work the all-star game, but I stayed back and had to work uh, the high A ball. Yeah. That's, that's there. That plays there. And I was still working, but they definitely came back and told me fun stories that were there for the all-star game. I'm sure. Who's your favorite player in the big leagues? Oof. I'm not too sure. It was that my favorite all-time player was Ivan Rodriguez, but uh, I would have to say somebody that I met and talked to that was at uh, Roger Dean. I just can't really put a finger on somebody right now. Yeah, so you mentioned Pudge, and you're a catcher. He is, you know, one of the all-time greats. Do you try to model your game after him? Do you watch a good amount of film? And, you know, especially considering he played for the Marlins, like, I'm, I'm sure he's one of your idols. Yeah, he's definitely somebody I, I grew up watching. Um, but I don't, I don't think I've tried to model my game after anybody. I just kind of go out and play and do what works for me. But just like watching Pudge and the way he played, I definitely try to model my attitude on the field after him. Yeah, a great leader for sure. Um, if you can walk us through some of the swag you got, uh, what brand of bat and what brand of glove do you use? 
I use a Rawlings glove. Uh, so in college, it, 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 my first three years there were, were wood bat. It was all wood bat conference. So I used whatever the school provided us, but we got to customize everything. So that was cool. Last year, I used Dovetail. And the Futures League, I used Dovetail as well. I've definitely, I used Marucci my freshman year. That's what we got. And then the other two years were Dovetail. What about baseball cleats? What, kind of, what brand of baseball cleats are you using? Always been a Nike guy. What led to that decision? Was that just comfort or? Uh, I think it's more comfort, yeah. They just, baseball cleats hurt your feet when you first get them. Nike's never really hurt my feet for that long, so I just stuck with wearing them. Is, uh, is Franklin Pierce a Nike school? No, we're Under Armour school. Okay. So are you required to wear Under Armour cleats then when you're playing for them? No, we have to wear, everything has to be Under Armour except for your cleats. They can be whatever grin. Got it. Interesting. Any baseball nicknames that you've acquired over the years? Jonesy. That's, per, that's, not, that's nice and simple. Nice. <laughs> yep. How about any superstitions that you've developed over the years? Uh, no superstitions. Not really a superstitious guy, but uh, my on-deck routine is the same every time. So you can say that's kind of superstitious. Want to walk us through that a little bit, just how, how that works? Uh, so I wait until the guy, or probably the third pitch in of the, the guy that's hitting before me. Uh, I'll start taking a couple swings. I take two swings with the weight on. And then I'll stretch a little bit, and then I'll just sit back and wait. And then uh, once he gets out or on or whatever happens and that bat is over, I'll knock the weight off, take a, two, uh, like a half swing and then a full swing, and then get up to the plate and knock my cleats off, and it's on. And let it fly. What happens if the guy in front of you has a first pitch fastball that he hits? You know, How do you adjust from there if you're not given a chance to wait for the third pitch or what have you? Uh, then I just kind of – do what I got to do to get ready, but I'll still take the same amount of time and do the same thing no matter how many pitches are in that at bat. Any game day meals that you like to eat in particular before games? No, nope, I don't think so. Whatever I can get my hands on pretty much. How about post game? Any good post game meals? No, nope, I like the same thing. Whatever, whatever I pass on the way home. <laughs> awesome. And then bubble gum or sunflower seeds? What's your preference? Gum for sure. What flavor and brand? Uh, Big league chew either the green or purple. How about a favorite all-time baseball memory over your many years of playing the game? Uh, so far, my favorite baseball memory would be my junior year when uh, we were in college ball behind and the last seed and everything and came out and won the, any, the, the conference championship and went all the way to the regional semifinal. Uh, who were you playing that day? And, you know, what was your experience in that game? Uh, that day we had to beat Merrimack twice. To, if they beat us once, they would have won the NE10 championship and then went to regionals, and we ended up winning both games that day and went to a regional. What is it like playing two games in one day, especially under those circumstances? Like, what's the adjustment like between games one and two, and how do you, you know, psych yourself up knowing you got to take two in a row against them and, you know, come back even stronger in the winner-take-all? Yeah, it was, it's def that was definitely a weird season because we had to go – going all the way back to – the beginning of the NE10 championship, we had to win out the last three games of the regular season to even get a bid into the, into the championship. So we beat Assumption, did what we needed to do, came back and lost the first game of the championship. And then we were like, oh, so we have to win, win out to be able to go to regionals because we didn't have a very good regular season, but we came back and built that momentum up. And then the last day we were like, all right, we're here. We have to win two games against Merrimack. And Merrimack had kind of pissed us off before in the, in the beginning of the regular season. So we, were, we had an out to go get them. And we came in and shut them down both games. I love it. Heard a lot today about you staying calm under pressure, like in Worcester, because the fans there are not having any superstitions. So definitely the most cool, calm, and collected guy we've had on here so <laughs> far. Well, Dylan, uh, Thank you so much for joining us today. That's going to do it for this episode. And uh, best of luck with everything. And we really hope to see you on the diamond soon this summer. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me. Thank you. Anytime, my friend. So this has been episode five of Back to the Futures, the official podcast of the Futures Collegiate Baseball League. We have new episodes coming out every Monday and Thursday leading up to the start of the season. Make sure to subscribe to our podcast. We're on iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, and YouTube. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see everyone soon.